Aaron Berkowitz back with the Jewish Literary Journal and Riva Valera, who is an artist, writer, and curator who focuses on the socially challenged body. Recipient of multiple awards for her visual work, Valera is best known for her representations of people whose physical embodiment, sexuality, or gender identity have long been stigmatized. Valera's memoir, Golem Girl, from One World slash Penguin Random House, won the 2020 Barbellion Prize for Literature and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's represented by Regal Hoffman and Associates in New York City and by Zola Lieberman Gallery in Chicago. Welcome, Riva. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. So I just wanted to start quickly with the title. I mean, uh, how the, the book opens. It's a memoir, obviously, of your experience around uh, the medical condition, the medical condition of spina bifida. Um, but I'm curious as to the choice of golem versus perhaps uh, the impression might be of Frankenstein's monster or perhaps more elementary Adam and Eve, you know, something about the body. Why the golem specifically? Well, um, to what extent do we think our audience knows what a golem is? Uh, I would think uh, they're well versed. Okay, so I hope at the very least, I don't know. You know, <clears throat> I've had to explain Gollum so many times. No, it's not Gollum, but that's influenced anyway. Um, well, I mean, I certainly started um, when I was a child uh, being very aware of Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, and not consciously connecting myself, but feeling a, a strong resonance, sometimes fear, sometimes attraction. And it wasn't until I was a teenager that I learned the story of the golem or in Yiddish, the goylem, der goylem. And I think I saw a piece of the original um, silent film uh, in Yiddish. And I have a good story about that, actually. Uh, something that happened recently. But when I when I saw the movie and then ended up reading uh, the uh, uh, original um, uh, folk tale, um, there was a way that uh, the passion of the rabbi trying to do the right thing um, lit something up in me because uh, Victor Frankenstein had always been portrayed as so um, a dreadful person, really kind of a dreadful person. And for me, the story of Frankenstein is very much about the story of a failed parent or the failed parentage. And not a lot of people know, parenthetically, that Mary Shelley, who wrote it when she was 19, that's all just leap off of a cliff now, um, she'd already lost children. And she continued to lose children. And she only had one, forget, uh, I think she had, I wanna say six pregnancies, um, several live births, but only one child that lived to adulthood. And so I didn't know that at the time, but the story of the golem, um, because the rabbi has good intentions, it actually felt more like my doctor's than Victor Frankenstein had. Um, and there's also the golem um, goes out in the world. And I mean, this is sort of thinking over years, um, the golem goes out in the world and performs the rabbi's uh, uh, desires, instructions. And each time it comes back, it's bigger and until it becomes unmanageably huge. And <clears throat> it was always sort of framed as, oh, well, that's part of its monstrousness. But to me, what's happening is that the golem is going out and experiencing the world. And as we know, when we uh, are in the world and learning of it, we become bigger, we become more. And to me, that's what's happening. Um, when I was a kid, going to school and I went to a special school. Um, they did their best for us, I think, at the time. But the one thing they never did was give us an idea of who we could be in the world. We were never talked to about um, our future lives, really. Um, we were taught home ec, so home economics, so that we could like feed ourselves and do some basic housekeeping. 
But even then, it, the idea was that we would be living with parents, living in a group home, living. We weren't being trained to even live on our own, much less have careers or families or interests or passions or anything. And so <clears throat> as I've thought about the golem over the years, the so there are many versions of that um, uh, folktale. And uh, there are a lot of plays that have been written about it, short stories, poems, essays. Um, there's a couple of great anthologies that put uh, the resources together. And in a lot of them, the monster wants to learn, um, is brought into the, the, um, the synagogue as kind of a Shabbos goy. It can do all these things on Shabbos that, you know, the Jews can't do. And it, you know, is told to bring water and clear away rubbish and, you know, do things. And sometimes it takes things too literally. Like, I think there's a story where it's told to bring water and it just keeps bringing water and bringing water until it like floods the synagogue. Um, <clears throat> but it wants to learn. It wants to learn Torah. And it's told, you don't have a soul. You can't. You're not qualified. And in some stories, it falls in love with the rabbi's daughter. And that's the biggest sin that it can commit. And the rabbi is, you know, utterly horrified. So over and over, the golem has a desire. It's told it can't. It doesn't qualify. And in the end, it's destroyed. And that's what spoke to me. It was being disabled later on, figuring out that I was queer and feeling like, um, in the world I grew up in, it was very clear that what I was expected to do was to live in my parents' house, you know, back bedroom, a basement, depend on my parents, maybe have a very undemanding job. Um, even though they knew I was smart and I was getting good grades and, you know, I was sent to a competitive high school, somehow there was still this sort of silent drop off about what that meant, what I was doing. What I, and at the same time, my brothers were being absolutely encouraged to become, you know, a doctor and in the other case, a, a communication scientist. Um, so I feel like in looking at the goal, I'm at, at the frustration of the monster. Um, I know that feeling. And then looking later and doing a lot of analysis around Frankenstein and the way that Frankenstein, there's debate about whether Mary Shelley knew the um, knew the story or not, but it was very well known. It was, you know, European part of yeah. European uh, culture. So the likelihood is that she did. And even if she didn't know that exact one, if you look at the story of the golem, it just permeates Western culture. The idea of the um, mystically created monster or the artificially created body that's brought to life through unnatural means and then becomes a threat. And so she didn't need to know the exact Yiddish story to know the story. Yeah. I mean, there's almost uh, <clears throat> an anti-Semitic trope about it, right? That the, the Jews would create this thing that would sort of get bigger um, and and it seemed that it would pervade in, in a in a negative way almost that the that would be the horror of it all that it's something uh, made by an other that the other itself is an you know it's some sort of sub sub other um, it's interesting uh, that you picked the golem also I think because one of the distinguishing distinguishing features of the golem versus perhaps Frankenstein's monster is that the golem doesn't speak right I don't think the golem ever learns language in traditional lore. Not in traditional lore. In some of the, I like the, what's his name, Breivik um, uh, play, in some of them, the golem does have dialogue. Um, and in Frankenstein, when you look at Frankenstein, the movie, the monster scarcely speaks, where in the book, he's quite articulate. So, you know, but, you know, in, in Genesis, um, Adam is referred to as um, Golmi. I think, which means shapeless. So the very first human, according to the Hebrew Bible, was a golem, you know, was clay that then is brought to life mystically. 
which then brings another creature to life mystically. And so our very beginning is as um, the word made flesh, which then, you know, Christianity takes that and reinterprets the idea of the word made flesh. It's interesting also when you're making the comparison with medicine. I mean, there is a hubristic sort of quality, <laughs> godlike sort of thing you have to take on no to, to feel confident in cutting somebody up or trying to manipulate bodies uh, in an almost, you know, godlike fashion. I want to ask one of my surgeons, um, so I've had a lot of surgery, and I also teach in medical humanities and I work in the cadaver lab. So been there, done that. Um, but I asked one of my surgeons once uh, whether I was the same person to them as we were speaking as I was on the operating table when I'm draped and you know she's probably not even seeing my face. And she looked really puzzled for a minute and she said, no, I guess not. I can't connect you or I couldn't do what I do. And I understood that. And that's the way they're trained. That is certainly the way they're trained. But it's also, so I, as I said, I teach in medical humanities in my, my uh, med hum class session, just the final session was for the term was yesterday. And so I was talking to them and I'm probably the first disabled person in med school that they will uh, encounter and the only professional one who's obviously disabled. Um, before they start seeing us in clinic. And that's one of the reasons I hold on to that job is that I want to be a disabled body who they have to treat professionally before they go to clinic. And what I was telling them is, if you can find out the life that the person wants to lead, not just the disease that they want to cure, what is the life they're trying to lead? And then try and help them get there in terms of what you're doing to their bodies. And it's a shift in perspective and it's a way of bringing together the person on the table and the person sitting in the um, exam room. Yeah, I think a, a big theme throughout your memoir is this idea of autonomy versus uh, perhaps expertise and how do we sort of balance what you want versus what might be best for you or how do we sort of uh, get to that point? Well, one thing is, um, so in the class that I teach, and by the way, I just want to say the book is not, I hope, grim. There's a lot of silly and there's a lot of Yiddish and there's all my paintings, which I don't know if I'll have a chance to see any of them here, but it's about my life as an artist. So it's not really a medical travelogue. What I tried to do was look at my life and think about the things that it illuminated about what it means to be different and my work with people who are different. So um, it's not the kind of memoir of, uh, I have an illness and this is how I have overcome it. And this is how you can overcome your difficulties too. And <clears throat> yeah, um, somebody asked me recently to be a motivational speaker. I, I might not have been that nice when I answered her. But, uh, but um, so what I teach is, uh, I teach at Northwestern Medical School, and we have a collection called the Airy Krantz Collection. And it's, for the most part, um, a number of vitrines, glass specimen jars that have uh, anomalous fetuses in them. So fetuses with quite a number of um, uh, developmental impairments. So missing limbs, um, failure of the, the skull to close over the brain, um, fusion of the limbs, um, midline defects where the, the organs develop outside the body, all these different things. And um, so I have them draw these, these individuals and then they have to do a presentation at the end where they have 15 minutes they have to have looked up um, the impairment that, they're, that they've spent weeks drawing. And then they have to do a biography, a non-medical biography of someone who has either that impairment or something 
analogous if it's not survivable. And then we talk about the lived people, like the people's lives. And my whole thing is to shift them away from thinking about a disability as a tragedy, which is how they're taught in med school. This is dreadful, this is a tragedy. You should probably counsel them, you know, if they can to, to terminate the pregnancy <clears throat> and on. And so I introduce them to people who are living lives in the bodies that they're encountering. And, you know, it's, I don't know if it'll have a lasting effect, but it's that, so the, to answer your question more directly, what I was talking about as we were talking about surgeries that generally happen to people like that, you wanna analyze it in this way. Is it something that's going to allow them to do more um, and to be less sick, to be more functional? <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm sorry. Or is it to normalize them? And where is the urge to normalizing coming from? Is it parental anxiety? Is it the doctor's assumption that everybody wants to be normal? Is it the patient wanting to be normal? And what would happen if they didn't do it? You know, what, what difference would it make? And that's not an easy question to ask, but it has to be asked because a lot of surgeries that, that masquerade as medically necessary are in essence, things to make you more normal. And yeah. that's not the world I wanna live in. Yeah, it seems to me almost that the easy sort of reading of trying to, or I don't know, maybe the revulsion that people see or feel when they see something atypical is, is not necessarily about what they're seeing, but more how it reflects on them, if that makes sense. I don't know if that, because they're reminded of what they have or what they don't have or how they sort of feel within that context, or do you feel it's, it's, it's a different? It's, I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, I think one is that, um, So I do, I'm doing some work in monster theory right now. And um, so disability and monster theory are <clears throat> heavily entwined. And the word for a lot of disabilities comes originally for words for monsters. So, so like I said, uh, there are a lot of words for impairments and disabilities that have Greek or Latin roots, meaning various kinds of monsters. And it's how, so before modern medicine, the way that people would explain anomalous birth was that um, the baby was a monster, the mother had seen a monster, someone had cast a spell on the mother, um, the mother had eaten something that had something to do with you know, mystical forces. Um, there's something called maternal imprinting, which is quite, I mean, it was happening up until like five seconds ago, which is the idea that something the mother saw even, or did, then would like go through her body and do something to the baby. And so we have thousands of years of this idea that monsters and people who are different are somehow the same. So think of the elephant man for a, you know, obvious example. And so um, one of the effects is that monsters are seen as violating boundaries. So if you're near somebody who's different, are they contagious? Are they going to hurt me? How are they going to act? Can I trust them to behave along the lines of societal norms? Um, you know, are they gonna drool on me? Are they gonna scream? Are they, am I responsible for them? There's all these ways that in the very, very reptilian bits of our brain, we see someone different and we don't know, first of all, we don't know how to behave because we don't know how they're gonna behave because none of us have been enculturated to talk to each other. So, I think that a lot of the anxiety is that, is that our society hasn't taught us how to be together, hasn't taught us what anything means. And so 
all we've got is staring and fear unless we're in a better social situation where people have norms. So like one of the things, so years ago I went to Berkeley for the first time and uh, University of California, Berkeley, I live in Chicago, this is Chicago here. But I was asked to do a gig at UC Berkeley and it is the mother planet for disability studies, disability rights, disability justice, culture, everything. And everything is accessible or people are gonna hear about it. And it's where uh, some of the original rights movements come from for, in disability rights are all rose in Berkeley, Oakland and Berkeley. So I'm walking around Berkeley and there are people in wheelchairs come in this way and people in wheelchairs come in that way and people crutches and canes and people you know signing and the thing i realized that not only was i seeing a ton of people like me um they all looked relaxed like in chicago if you're something like yeah something like that um it, your head's down you're not looking at anybody if you have to look at somebody you're braced for what the hell they're going to say to you you're not expecting civil behavior. And there's just like such defensiveness. Nobody meets your eyes. I mean, if you're disabled. And I didn't see any of that in Berkeley because not only was Berkeley accessible, Berkeley talks about stuff. Berkeley has social norms and it, it was gorgeous. I never wanted to leave. I was very resentful when I'd get back on the plane, like, please keep me, please. and. So I think that um, I don't want to be um, a disability guru here. I don't want to start laying down a bunch of, this is what you should do. But this is where I think the fears are. And it's exhausting. I mean, yeah. people, if I'm out in public, people are going to say stuff. Always, always. <laughs> Yeah, is that part of sort of the underlying, I know you do portraiture, you're known for uh, portraiture. Is that sort of the impetus behind that? Uh, to at least display, talk about, you know, in uh, in a metaphorical sense, uh, disabilities and, and things that are atypical? Well, so years ago, and I write about this in the book, um, and just by the way, um, the whole first part of the book, a lot of it's about my mother, who was a really interesting forceful, unusual person. So if you like mom stories, a lot of mom in there uh, and my family. And then the second part is about how to grow up at a time when we had no rights at all and becoming a, a portraitist. Um, so like I said, Aaron, um, I've always gotten stared at. And when I met in 1998, seven, I got invited to join this group of people with disabilities who were all like writers and performers and dancers and um, academics. And they gave me a completely different idea of what it meant. Um, but the one thing we all had in common, if we had a visible disability or disability that was <clears throat> performative in some way. So, you know, you might look normal, but the way that you were moving or speaking or something um, was different. And so what we all had in common is we were stared at constantly. And I have always loved portraiture and I wanted to do their portraits. Um, it's a long story. But the thing I realized I had to do was figure out how to let people, ask people to let me look at them for a long ass time um, without triggering that horrible experience of being stared at. So um, not only did I find, do I find people who are different, incredibly beautiful, not despite, not, you know, I mean, straight up beautiful. The way that people find to live in their bodies with creativity is just like, it's like going to like, Niagara Falls or something like total awe and beauty and 
I mean, right now I'm working on a portrait. Here we are in my studio. Can't really tip this much more, but this is an, <laughs> a disabled non-binary um, fashion designer named Sky Kubaku, who has a, a company called Rebirth Garments. And they, um, they make clothing with and for and in collaboration with the kind of people I work with. So disabled, queer, BIPOC, people who feel like the fashion industry doesn't give a crap about them. Um, so Sky is sitting, I'm uh, sitting for me right now. Um, so the first thing was, I just wanted to show people the beauty. And also I knew that there was virtually no history of portraiture, um, totally left out of the history of, of Western portraiture, just with rare exceptions. Um, and I also wanted to work with people to think about what it meant to be looked at with pleasure, because I was looking at them with pleasure. And that wasn't something a lot of us had experienced. And so working with me for weeks or months or sometimes longer, um, I know from what they've said that it, it did affect what they saw in the mirror and how they felt when they went out in the world. And then some of them would use those portraits um, in their own work as performance backdrops or, or text in their writing or whatever. And I've been profoundly, totally, I mean, they saved my life. They changed me from somebody who really didn't want to exist, frankly to someone who, um, so like yesterday I was down on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And I don't know if I can show you this. I don't know, let's see if this is possible. <clears throat> can you see my shoe here? Yes. So high top boot, very uh, thick prescription, bright red shoelaces. I have a whole shoelace wardrobe. So I'm going down Michigan Avenue and I've got my complicated wardrobe on and people are stopping me all the way down the street and saying, wow, you know, love your look, great boots. You know, this is different than when I was growing up when what the things that I, I mean, this is new in the last 10 years, I think. 10 years ago, it would have been, why are you walking that way? What's wrong with you? Um, I'd have people screaming freak at me from cars, throwing rocks, um, one time memorably throwing fruit. I don't know what that was about, but I got hit by a lime in the street, you know, people. But the world is changing and I am visibly different. And I was walking with a cane and people weren't making fun of me. They were saying they liked my look. And I'm a 65 year old cripple. And that's what I'm working towards is like, if you're different, you can be in the world with some flair and you can be looked at with some pleasure. And I came home in a good mood instead of 10 years ago, feeling like just a little knot of a person who wanted to hide under the bed. Yeah, it's interesting thinking around change also like, something that seems to creep up in the book also is sort of perhaps in, you know, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or even further back that this idea of the body was representational of the mind always. So that if you saw somebody who was perhaps a full body, then somehow their mind also was connected, which is obviously not scientifically the case. Um, or the idea of like children as many adults who just have to get there versus seeing a separation between a child as its own thing and an adult as a, you know, the, there's just this sort of insistence on creating one spectrum to go through rather than allowing for uh, differences within, you know, peaks and valleys. I was reading this article in the New Yorker called, uh, like I said, something like, are you the same person as you were as a child? And this man has a four-year-old son and they're having just a blast. He's talking about how much fun his kid is and all the charming things they're doing. And then thinking he has almost no memory of himself as four years old and feeling very sad that maybe his son will not remember any of these wonderful times. And then he starts looking at other people's thoughts about those divisions of, you know, 
apparently they say that there are two kinds of people, one that are sort of see things as a continuum and others who see things as epochs, as time periods. I'm more the latter. Um, apparently the latter are more apt to look backwards and, and analyze who they were at different points. And I certainly know that I've been a really different person. And it was in response to um, not just growing up, but how the world was treating me. And so I think that's true for, I would guess for a lot of people who are different, you're out in the world and actually I'm writing a new book and it's fiction. And it's very much about a disabled person, disabled young woman um, who has a facial variance and one of the ongoing questions in the book is to what extent are we all um, sort of Plato in the face of society? Like where is the line between who we originally are, what we could be, and the impacts of who we're told we are? And I don't have an answer. I don't, I'm not going to end up at the end of the book with ta-da, this is how you can be original. This is, But I've really been thinking about a lot about um, our child selves. Because I, I, in doing the memoir, I did go back and I remember myself a certain way as a child. And I was going back and talking to family members and old neighbors and they're like, oh no, you weren't like that at all. You were totally outgoing. You were totally... And I remember being like... And so I don't know what to make of that. You know, when did my memory of myself as uh, withdrawn and terrified take over who I apparently was to other people? So, you know, I wonder what that's like for other people, for you or people in our audience. You know, is there a is there a conflict between who you think you are and who other people tell you are or were or that's yeah you know i mean something that always comes to mind when i i speak about these kinds of things is um the psychologist uh jacques lacan and his mirror stage and this idea around uh you know how we perceive ourselves to ourselves and then yeah as you're saying and you know there's almost like three different layers of perception um you know internal our own physical perceptions of ourselves and then how other people perceive you know within a small sphere and then in a larger sphere um so there is a lot of different sort of gazings or viewings of of yourself that can be reflected or internalized that's the internalized part that's interesting to me because you know we all, we've all had things happen where we could just shrug it off like oh this person doesn't get me uh, whatever but um but i think that to go through stages i'm really curious about people who are more continuous you know not looking back whether there are people whose lives are somewhat more normative, um, who haven't been maybe constantly challenged and had to um, <clears throat> assess, reassess um, their identity. You know, it would be an interesting study. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's kind of reminded me of sort of a I don't know, like a Jewish mindset where it's like all about anxiety and depression versus perhaps, you know, the fantasization, the fantasy that if you were not Jewish, you wouldn't have all these sort of perhaps epigenetic things passed down that give you these weird trauma sort of uh, responses to life. I don't know. Do you think, um, I don't know much about the roots of Hasidic um, thought, but I wonder if there's any connection between um, the rise of sort of joyous Judaism, as we understand it, to the self-reflection of Judaism as, um, uh, a, if not a burden, a place where we are continually um, witnesses to the worst of human behavior. You know, I mean, do you know I, much about that? I mean, I, I know a little bit about the origin. Um, I do know Obviously, there was, you know, as we're talking about the golem, obviously that it's born within a land of pogroms and, and things that are going on at the time. There's also sort of uh, an acad academic 
uh, aspect to Judaism that's creeping up more and more. And, and this is a direct response, I think, to both of those things at once. I also think a lot about sort of um, Hasidic movements as uh, uh, influenced by Catholicism in the region at the time and sort of the thought processes around um, moving Judaism from an academic slash um, physical embodiment to a more thought and representational religion um, and sort of how that uh, breeds in with Catholicism and, you know, the idea of Judaism moving to Catholicism. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure what to make of all, um, but it is an interesting sort of thought around how do we develop our psychological barriers in response to trauma? You know, how what kind of control do we try and, and take over uh, our experiences? Uh, either that's through, you know, direct tight grip, perhaps through academic uh, you know, we make it academic so that, you know, there's a step one, then there's a step two. And then, you know, or do you sort of say, no, it's all sort of free. And as long as you sort of have a spirit about it, I don't know, I'm not sure yet. That's interesting because the thing that really started to change my experience of being disabled and queer um, was meeting people who were doing two things. One was theory, because I had never had a way to intellectually, I mean, I'm fairly intellectually oriented person. I'm not an academic, but thought and theory is, has always been important to me. Um, so the first thing they gave me was a uh, machinery of thought that had been completely missing. And the second thing they gave me was um, a way of embodying being different um, that had to do with reveal rather than conceal. And so I was lucky I got both those things at once and I still have both those things moving through my life. And one of the things, again, that I'm trying to do in, uh, in med school, um, and I'm about to do a, um, a, a gig in Cincinnati. They finally, Cincinnati finally noticed that I wrote a book. It only took three years, but you know, was it, I forget if it was Mark Twain or W.C. Fields who said, when the end of the world comes, make sure you're in Cincinnati because everything gets there 10 years later. So, you know, he had it right. Um, but so they finally noticed. So they're bringing, the med school's bringing me in. And one of the things that I always say when I'm there is there's this huge culture and your, your patients need to know that there are writers and movie makers and performers and singers and whatever whatever your art form is, poets, whatever, there's somebody, more than one somebody, thinking about embodiment um, in that form. And it's, I mean, it's exploding. It's just exploding and waiting for the world to notice. It could be a while, but, but it's there. And, and it's that it's beauty. It's that it's, I mean, people are dealing with hard things sometimes in the work, but sometimes it's just beauty. And I mean, I'll notice, I'll mention, wait, words, words are caught in the lungs, I guess. Um, but my friend, Alice Shepard, for instance, the dancer, who is so just bloody brilliant. She's been doing this performance with her dance partner, Laura Lawson, um, caught a scent. And it's wheelchair dance in uh, in the air using harnesses. So it's aerial dance in wheelchairs. And I was showing my students yesterday and they're like, but that's the level of rethinking, you know, that people are doing. And in terms of my own work, I, I hope people look it up. I have a website. Um, most of the recent work is on there a little bit but you know i don't just work with people with disabilities i work with people in the queer community and the trans community too and people who are bipoc and i mean um sky is um uh, philippinex and and so many of our stories meet in the middle you know this is what it's like to be in my body this is what it's like to try and have love. This is what it's like to try and have family. This is, you know, they're just, they just, we have to, I mean, there are differences obviously, but, but I feel so lucky 
to be able to be part of the story. Yeah, I guess uh, as we sort of wrap up, make what what is the website so that people can keep up, especially with if you're writing a new book. Uh, you know, hopefully it'll it'll come out and people can find it. Yeah, hopefully I know. I'll that. finish I know it. <laughs> um, uh, it's my name, Riva Lehrer, um, R I V A L E H I E R Art dot com. Don't go to rivalair.com. It got kidnapped and is now a bunch of gibberish, gibberish and I think Japanese, um, but rivalairart.com. And there's a lot of YouTube stuff and articles and, and stuff. There's a, I'm, I'm kind of splattered all over the place, but this has been a pleasure. It's been really nice meeting you, Aaron. And I'm really, really grateful that you invited me. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate taking the time, especially it's, I know hectic things going on, but I appreciate well, it. Thank you. Gotta poke at this. Everybody stay safe. Have a lovely Pesach and um, go be different.